Welcome to From Amia to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director for the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we join Professor Sir Hugh Strawn on the first day of the battlefield tour for his morning briefing to the students before they visited the Somme battlefields to explore how lessons learned during the Battle of the Somme would influence the Battle of Amiens in 1918. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour à tous. What you will see today is a very different landscape from the landscape that was here in 1916 or 1918. And I say that in my capacity as a Commonwealth War Graves Commissioner. One of the things the Commission did was, in a sense, wreck the battlefields. I say that to be provocative, but I said also to alert you because they created a new built landscape here. It's dramatic, it's evocative, it's moving, but it can get in the way of your understanding of the ground. Remember that those cemeteries, those memorials were not here at the time. There were cemeteries, certainly, but not in the form that they are now there. Each morning, what I want to do is address three themes. So I'm going to talk about alliances, about the role of geography in understanding this war, and I'm going to conclude by talking about the strategy that then tries to bring all this together. So let me begin with alliances. This is a coalition war. We are in France. Two thirds of the Western Front was held by the French army, something that British visitors too often forget. And the bulk of the fighting for much of the war is sustained by the French and of course south and east from here. That point reflects something, which is that in 1914, Britain, France and Russia form an alliance and that they are triggered in many respects to enter this war by what happens to Serbia and Belgium. Now, the point from the other side is that Germany and Austria-Hungary, the core alliance for the central powers, occupy a position in Europe which is genuinely central. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is an ancient empire that runs in 1914 from the southern frontier of Germany across the Balkans and right up against the Ottoman Empire. This matters crucially in how you understand the war. The point here is that during the course of the war, much of the fighting is determined by the desire to seek fresh allies. Once the war breaks out and there is a realization that in some ways there is a broad equivalence between the two sides, each country comes to believe that if it can get one more ally, then it could just shift the balance of forces. And where that is particularly powerful in 1914 to 1916 is the pursuit of allies in the Balkans. Italy joins the Entente Powers in 1915. Bulgaria joins the Central Powers in September 1915, but no one side has a decisive influence in switching the balance of the alliances. Although by the time that we're beginning to pick up the story in 1916, the balance is swinging towards the side of the Entente, towards the British, the French, the Russians. Because by then, not only have they acquired Italy, they've also acquired Romania, they've acquired Greece in 1917, And most importantly of all, the United States might not be in the war, but in German eyes, it is a de facto ally of Britain and France, because to all intents and purposes, it can only trade with Britain and France. So much of the resources of the United States seem already to be available, even in 1916, if you're sitting in Berlin. What does this mean in terms of the geography of the war? What it means is that Germany and Austria-Hungary can switch troops quickly from the Western Front, from here on the Somme, for example, to fight in Russia or to fight in the Balkans because they control the railway lines that run across Europe and they have the shorter distances to cover. 
they can firefight their way out of a crisis. So they may be fighting on the Western Front, but if they have a crisis in the East, they can put whatever available disposable troops they have onto trains and shuttle them to the East, and vice versa. How do the Entente powers deal with that problem? Their challenge geographically is a profound one. The only direct communication between Britain and France in the West and Russia in the East is either to go north, and those Russian ports to the north, Murmansk, Archangel, are closed in the winter months, or to go south through the Mediterranean, but then you have to go through the Dardanelles to get to the Black Sea. In 1915, the Allies tried to deal with that problem by the attack at Gallipoli, but with the closure of the Dardanelles, thanks to the Ottoman Empire's entry into the war on the Central Powers side, that route, direct connection to Russia, is closed off. So the Entente Powers can only communicate with each other by sea, by a longer route, and by a route that is increasingly insecure as Central Powers submarines provide a challenge both in the Mediterranean and in the Atlantic. So the challenge throughout the war for the Entente Powers is how do you bring your power to bear in the European theatre, given the fact that you're operating on the peripheries of Europe rather than its heart. And the geographical strength that the Central Powers have is that they are in the heart of Europe and they can shift forces from one side to the other. How do you resolve this problem from the point of view of the Entente powers if you have the capacity to win the war after Britain enters this war? There is no doubt that if the war goes on long enough, the Entente powers can win it. They can win it because they have the resources of the British Empire as well as the resources of the French and the Russian empires available and also the indirect support already of the United States. They can draw on the resources of the rest of the world. The question is how do they channel and control them to the point that they can be of maximum effect at the right place at the right time. The answer to that problem is inherently very difficult because there is this problem of communication. And from the beginning of 1915, the solution in the eyes of the French and the British has been let us focus on mobilizing Russia. Russia is, in many people's eyes, the coming great power of Europe, the country with the landmass, the resources, and the peoples to produce a major military player. But they don't have the equipment, so can the British in particular engineer a supply route to Russia to mobilize this Russian manpower? In some ways, the British policy which some would characterize as fighting to the last Frenchman, now becomes fighting to the last Russian. And the French, although they are mounting major offensives in 1915, are predominantly concerned with holding the Germans in the West, precisely so the Russians can be effective. The German solution in 1915 is the reverse of that. The Germans, having achieved initial gains here in France, which means that by the early stages of the war, they're already controlling something like 60% of France's productive capacity and its resources, because they have achieved that control, decide that they will create defensive positions across Belgium and northeastern France, which is going to force the Allies to attack. We have to remember that Britain and France are in the position where essentially they have to attack to regain the ground that is lost in order to have a good negotiating position if there is to be a peace settlement. At the same time, Germany, by holding the high ground here very often, can force the battle on terms that are favorable to Germany. What that means is that in 1915, Germany is able to concentrate its efforts in Russia. So just as Britain and France might like to fight most of the war through Russia in 1915, so Germany actually wants to fight the war in Russia because there it is able to achieve significant gains. We tend to forget that in 1915, it's a year of German and Austro-Hungarian victories. They overrun the Baltic states as they would now be defined, Poland as it would now be defined, and Serbia. They are in control of Eastern Europe and of the Balkans. So this central power bloc has become even bigger and more effective. That's the situation at the end of 1915, pretty desperate. Failure at Gallipoli, failure to produce an effective Russian response, and therefore a desire to find a new solution to the problem. 
In December 1915, Joffre, the French commander-in-chief, convenes a meeting at Chantilly, which is attended by the other Allied commanders. At this stage of the war, and indeed up until 1917, France is effectively the de facto commander on the Western Front. The British Army is small and subordinate by comparison. France is going to make the strategy in terms of how this war is fought. And for France, this, after all, is a war of national survival and of national liberation. The policy that is proposed for 1916 in December 1915 is given the geographical problems of operating around the periphery of Europe, what the Allies have to do is to coordinate their forces so that they attack simultaneously on the Western Front, on the Eastern Front, and on what we'll call loosely the Southern Front, that is, say, Italy and the Balkans. Because if they can do that, then the Central Powers' resources, instead of being shuttled on these railway lines across Europe, on the short cords will have to be concentrated at one point at a time and will not be able to be moved. So the Somme battle arises from that decision, from the decision that there will be an offensive in the West, there will be an offensive minded by the Russians in the East, and there will be an offensive or offensives in the Balkans and from the Italian front as well. That's the plan. What happens, of course, is the enemy is left out of the equation because in February 1916, the Germans attack at Verdun. And the story in the run-up to the opening of the Somme offensive is how to contain that battle. We now think of Verdun as the crucial battle of the First World War. But in many ways, both sides are trying to contain it to keep it limited. On the French side, the reason for that is that Joffre is keen for the battle to be on the Somme because it is where the British and French armies meet. It can be a joint battle. Originally, it is designed to be a battle in which France would be the leading player. The consequence of Verdun is that the French contribution is reduced. But don't believe the story that Britain fights the Battle of the Somme in order to relieve the French at Verdun. That may be an after-effect of the battle. It is not a planning assumption. Douglas Haig, when he wrote his final dispatch in December 1916 at the conclusion of the Battle of the Somme, said we fought it to relieve the French of Verdun, and in that we were successful. Rubbish. It may have been successful, but it was never the intention. And indeed, by the time the Battle of the Somme is launched on the 1st of July 1916, the French have already contained the German attack. The Germans, as a result of Russia launching its attack at the beginning of June 1916, have already had to reduce their commitment on Verdun and to shift troops to the Eastern Front. And so in the second half of 1916, France is fighting and winning two battles simultaneously on the Western Front. It's winning on Verdun, regaining all the ground that it has lost in the first half of 1916, and it makes a major contribution, particularly in the opening days of the Battle of the Somme, where it is far more successful than the British were, at the southern end of the Somme front. It's worth bearing in mind for France that whereas it loses 375,000 casualties in the course of the 10 months of fighting at Verdun in 1916, it loses about 200,000 on the Somme in half the time, in five months here. So the Somme battle is being fought as part of a grander coalition strategy which is designed to have European effect. When you look at the ground, one of the most striking things here is there is very limited ground of geographical significance. The road from here to Bapaume and back indeed in the other direction to Amiens is essentially the hub of the battlefield. But in the end, it's not where the tactical success is achieved. Fayol, who was the French army commander on the Somme front, the commander of the 6th French army, constantly in his diary in 1916 says, what is the objective on the Somme? What is it we're aiming for? Unlike many other points on the Western Front, there is no high ground here. There is no crucial objective in terms of a railway junction or a main line of communications within spitting distance of the Somme Front. The only reason for fighting here is 
the grand strategic perspective, that it's where the two armies come together and it is where they can contribute to a multi-front approach to this war. The final thought I'd like to leave you with is this, that this is a so-called battle, singular, which lasts for five months. And it's been fought alongside another battle, singular, called Verdun, which lasts for 10 months. This is not the conventional understanding for soldiers of the First World War of what a battle means. A battle for them is, in their imaginations, the Battle of Waterloo or the Battle of Austerlitz, a battle of a single day with decisive effects. Neither of these battles is decisive. And indeed, the reason the fighting stops is the days become too short and the armies are too exhausted to continue. The ground is too broken up. Again, weather and geography have extraordinarily determining consequences. So the fighting it peters out. Both these areas, both Verdun and the Somme, are ones that are fought over continuously from 1914 to 1918. But that, of course, is another story for tomorrow. Thank you very much. That was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, we visit the Newfoundland Memorial Park at Beaumont-Hamel.